so welcome to the session from Dev to Broad with GitLab CI. I know this is the post-lunch session, which means that some of you might want to fall asleep. I'm totally fine with that. Um, if you do so, try to avoid snoring so that your, your uh, attendees are next to you are, are not affected. A um, few words about me. Um, as I said, hi, my name is Stefan. Um, when I'm not speaking at conferences, I do run my own co uh, company. The company is called BitExpert. Um, we are a technology company doing custom applications for our clients of all sorts. Uh, my current role at BitExpert is called Head of Technology. That means I'm responsible for getting technology knowledge into the company, as well as um, organizing the whole educational programs that, that, that we provide for our employees, developers, as well as, as project managers. Um, and since I've still got some spare time left, and I'm not exactly sure how that happens, uh, I'm not organizing one, but two PHP user groups. Um, so one is the PHP user group in Frankfurt, and the other one is called the PHP user group Metropolregion Rhein-Neckar. Well, that's a very German name. But yeah, um, basically what I'm saying, if you're close to Frankfurt or if you're close to Mannheim, feel free to swing by. Um, we're always looking for speakers and, and attendees as well. Um, but I guess that's not what you're here for. You're here for, for this, GitLab. Who of you has heard of GitLab before? Great. Who of you is using GitLab? OK. Who of you likes GitLab? OK. Same amount of hands. That's good. <laughs> Quick check if everything's up. <laughs> Great. Um, but the question is then, why, why are you here if, you, if all of you are using GitLab? But I'm sure I have a few games with me that, that you will find interesting. Um, so, for those of you who don't know what GitLab is, this is what Wikipedia says. GitLab is a web-based Git repository manager with wiki and issue tracking features. And to be fair, this is still true today, um, but GitLab is way more than that these days. Um, roughly, I think two years ago, the GitLab guys announced their Beyond CI CD strategy, meaning that they do not only want to cover the dev parts and not only cover the ops parts, but making sure that like, everything is working seamlessly out of the box. Meaning you as a developer, you can plan new features by creating milestones and issues. Uh, you can create them by obviously committing code and, and pushing it to, to GitLab. Uh, you can verify them by hopefully writing tests. Um, that's what hopefully all of you do. Um, then package that stuff, releasing it, configuring build pipelines, um, monitoring your applications on staging and production, and then again transitioning to the planning phase on improving existing features or, or planning new features. And making sure that, as I said, everything works seamlessly together out of the box. But let's get started. First things first, how do you install GitLab? Um, well, there are a couple of options. Uh, you could use the GitLab Omnibus installer, which is like the de facto standard. Um, there are packages for Debian, there are packages for RPM, um, or as all the cool kids these days do, run it in, in Docker. So there's a Docker image on, on Docker Hub uh, called GitLab-CE, so CE stands for Community Edition, that you can use. And this is basically more or less what, what we are doing. Uh, we are not using the default image, we've built it our own because, um, because reasons. Just kidding. Um, but for the sake of this talk, it's, it's just, like, just like use the default image. Um, publish a couple of ports, port 80, port 22, and, and that's basically it. So you wait like two or three minutes. GitLab is, is then spun up. Um, the database is up and running. It will install itself, do the database migration, and all that stuff. Cool. So that's, that's one piece of, of the puzzle. Um, since during this talk we are building a Docker image and we deploy Docker images, we do need a place to store them, a Docker registry. Now these days GitLab comes with a Docker registry built in. Back in the days when we started this whole journey, this wasn't the case. So we had to look for an alternative, which luckily we already in place, and this alternative is called Zone Type Nexus. So, um, it originates from the Java world, was used for hosting Maven packages, but these days they host a lot of more NPM, Bower, um, Docker, and, and, and whatnot. So this is, this is basically what, what we are using for. Um, similar to GitLab, we run this in, in a Docker container, which is quite fun, running a Docker registry in a Docker container that hosts Docker images, but that's a different story again. Um, these days, there exists an official Zonotype Nexus image. Back in the days when we started, this wasn't the case, so we built it our own. Um, 
And if you don't know how, how that looks like, this is basically the, the nice, fancy UI it comes with. Um, perfect for a Java application. That's probably the best I, I can say. Um, what's really important in the whole process is that GitLab needs to authenticate against Nexus. And this is also the case if you, if you would run or if you would use the registry that GitLab provides. So at some point, you need to log in this registry, provide the username and password, and then you're able to pull and push those images. Um, depending on how you set, set things up, uh, you could do this once on the host or during each and every build that, that you're running. So this, this is a bit of like going, going either way or the other, depending on, on your situation. And the third piece of the puzzle that we need is an HTTP reverse proxy, as we do want to run multiple Docker instances on one host or multiple applications on one host. Um, we need to make sure that we have something up in front that does like the routing and stuff. Um, again, there are hundreds of solutions you could use, um, Nginx, AJ Proxy, or we use traffic. Who of you has, has heard of traffic before? Okay. Who likes traffic? Okay, a few, few, few of the hands. Okay, no worries. Um, I like it because it's like super simple to configure. It's like 15 lines of code and, and you got the whole thing up and running. Um, what you need to define first is you need to instruct traffic to um, expose HTTP and HTTPS traffic. Um, and then you configure those, those entry points, saying HTTP traffic should be served on port 80, and we also do an HTTPS um, upgrade, so any HTTP connection get instantly upgraded to HTTPS, so that our applications itself don't need to care about it. And for HTTPS connections, we say they should listen on, or they should be served from, from port 443, and this is the certificate that, that we are using for, for this. Now, since we use myapp.log as a custom domain, we can't use a service like Let's Encrypt to generate those, those certificates. But this is something that traffic can do automatically. So if you use a public available domain and traffic is available publicly or accessible publicly, um, you could easily say, okay, just do the magic with Let's Encrypt, generate those certificates on the fly, and, and everything is good. Now, where does traffic get its configuration from? And this is the pretty cool part. Um, there are multiple configuration backend support. The easiest one is probably saying, OK, traffic, like here's a Docker socket. Just listen to it and uh, watch the events that happen there and then just magically generate your configuration um, as, as you see it. Uh, you can also hook it up into Rancher. That's another solution. You could use etcd and, and all sorts of, of key value stores. So you're pretty open in, in um, picking your, your configuration endpoint. Um, as with, with the other stuff, we are running it as a Docker container. We are publishing three ports, port 8080, that's like the management console. Um, should probably not publish that publicly, should um, make sure that only you can, can have access to it. And then just publish the ports 80 and 443, and then mount the Docker socket into the, into the container, as well as the configuration file that we've just created. And that's, that's basically it. Now, let's get started. Um, so for those of you who don't know GitLab, this is basically how it looks um, when you create a new project. All you need to do is provide a project name. Uh, we just ignore the description for now and the visibility level. Um, that's, that's basically it. Create the, click the Create Project button, and the Git repository is created. Um, as an alternative, you could also use the create from template functionality, which then would also generate a default file structure um, within your, your newly created Git repository. But unfortunately, the GitLab people just don't like us PHP people, and they just have Ruby Spring and, and Node as, as a current offering. So that's probably not the way you want to go. Um, so we need to build the application and the structure ourselves. Now, when I arrived at this point of the presentation, I was wondering, like, <clears throat> what kind of application should I use or could I use to, to show you how, how awesome this, this GitLab stuff is? Um, I could have built one myself, but that would contain the risk that I build it in a way that it runs perfectly with, like, this whole, whole GitLab infrastructure. So that was a way I, I, I really wanted to avoid. So um, I went back and forth and... Um, was looking for an application that was like not so easy to install, comes with a bit of complexity, and um, I ended up using Magento. 
I thought that's, that's probably a good, good way of doing so. So we got a fan over here, right? <laughs> kind of. Not you, Derek. No, no, no yeah, definitely not. Um, luckily, Magento uh, can be installed using Composer these days. So I just say Composer Create Project, and then point it to repo magento.com. That's like the packages of, of Magento. And we're using the Project Community Edition installer. And um, like after a couple of minutes, after Composer downloaded like half of the internet, um, we got all the dependencies up there. And we can um, add, commit, and push those into our GitLab instance. And this is basically how it looks. So we've got the first commit over here, and we're good to go. Now, up to this point, you're going to, nothing happens regarding builds. Right? So the code has landed in GitLab, but, but nothing happens. Um, to be able to build that code or to do anything with it, uh, we need to install a fourth piece of the puzzle. That's the last one, I'm promising. And that puzzle piece is called a GitLab runner. It's also from the GitLab folks. Um, the idea is this. We have GitLab and the GitLab CI module, which acts as kind of like a master instance that would coordinate um, which runners are available and which jobs can be run where. And the code that you want to execute um, are executed in the context of such a runner instance. Now, the cool thing about this is that you could, for example, use the GitLab SAS offering, but host those runners on your own, either like locally in, on, on your own machines, locally in your data center, or locally in the cloud. Well, not really locally in the cloud, but you get the point. Um, and then just connect that to the GitLab SAS offering, and then all the code is built then on your machines, so to speak. So that's, that's pretty cool. If you want to get started, this is probably a good, good way of, of, of doing that. Um, you can install that, such a runner uh, in multiple ways. Again, there are Debian packages, there are RPM packages, there is a Docker container. Just pick what makes the most sense for you. Um, we just need to mount the configuration file and the Docker socket, and, and you're good to go. Now, the situation is, is, is this. We got two Docker containers. Well, got four, actually, but details don't matter. So one is GitLab, one is the GitLab instance, and one is the runner. They run side by side, but they don't know each other up to now. So we need to connect them. Right. To do that, um, we first have to open the admin section of, of GitLab and um, access the runner overview page. And over here, there are two important informations. One is the URL to GitLab. Technically, you would know that. Otherwise, you couldn't see this page. And the other one is called the registration token. And the idea behind this is that you don't want any third-party runner to connect to your own GitLab instance, because otherwise that code could be built and checked out like anywhere in the world by anyone, right? So this authentication token, just make sure you know this, or, or you can set up this runner or configure that runner to talk to your instance. So having these two information, we can create a runner instance. This is done by calling GitLab runner register. Um, first thing it asks you is, what's the URL of your GitLab instance? We know that. Second thing it asks, give me the authentication token. We know that. We enter that. Cool. Um, you can pass a description for this runner. So if you have multiple ones, you know what, the, what this runner is for. Um, you could provide tags for this runner. And um, this is something I'll show you throughout the talk, why this is important or what you can do with it. Um, I'll just leave it for now as is. You can tell the runner to only run builds that are tagged with a specific tag. Or you can instruct the runner to build like potentially like anything. Uh, you could lock the runner to just one GitLab project which may be interesting if you have a runner in the data center of a client and you just want to run certain jobs um, um, in that instance. But that really depends on, on your setup. And now the, the most important question. What is the executor that all the commands that, that you will define later on in, in the configuration file, how do you get those executed? Uh, you could use shell, which basically means all the commands you execute are um, run by a GitLab runner user within our container we just created. Now, that's, that, that's maybe OK for a few commands. But if you want to install third-party packages or stuff, you can't do that because you're not root. Um, so that, that's potentially a problem. Or you could say, hey, spin up a new Docker instance, a new Docker container, run all that stuff within that container. Um, 
which probably is a bit better. And they have dozens of options like Docker SSH, Docker Machine, Docker Machine SSH, whatever. Um, so you can, can make sure you pick like the best, the best runner or the best executor for, for your environment. And last but not least, you can define a default Docker image. So if you don't define an image in your project or in your job, um, this will be the one that, that will be taken instead. So pick a sensitive choice. Just don't use the Ruby one if you build a PHP project. That probably doesn't make sense. Right. Um, now what you can do is you can register multiple of these instances for one runner daemon. And they can be configured completely differently. Com doesn't really matter. Um, so that, that's important to know. The outcome of all of this is a configuration file that, that looks like this. Uh, you can also edit it by hand and then just restart the runner and everything will be fine. Um, for example, changing the number of concurrent builds that should be run um, globally or then locally for each of those runners. Or as we do, we um, mount a volume containing like all the composer files from the host into the container so that um, we don't need to re-download all the packages over and over again just to save a bit of time. So this is an idea that, that we were using back in the days of Vagrant um, when all the devs were running that stuff locally just to avoid like this massive downloads of packages all over, the, all over again. So this can speed up the builds a bit. Great. <clears throat> and then after like a minute or so, this new runner appears on this runner overview page over here, and we can use it. So that's, that's pretty simple. Um, To be fair, when I showed you how to, to use the composer install command, um, I just missed one important information. Um, you need to be authenticated against this, this Magento registry, otherwise you can't pull those files. So you need a way of somehow managing secrets. Um, obviously, we can do that in this um, GitLab configuration file that's checked in in the repository, but that feels like, nah, that's, that's not really cool. Um, we, we are looking for something else. And luckily, GitLab has, has got us covered. Um, they have a functionality that they call managing secrets, where you can define secrets either on a project level or on a group level. That means I could create a group within GitLab saying, OK, these are all my Magento projects, and um, create my, my Magento projects beneath that group, and then expose the, these two, two, two variables, like the username and the password, on the group level. And they get then inherited to the, to the different projects. So again, that may or may not make sense in your, in your situation. <clears throat> and this is basically how it looks. So you open the settings page, and then you've got a section called secret variables. Just give it a name, give it a value, and, and, and off you go. You can say, for sake of security, um, that those variables should only be available for protected branches. That means that only a certain amount of people with a certain role within GitLab are able to push to those branches, and you avoid the risk of like, um, yeah, someone echoing username and password, and you do, would, would see the, the result. So again, depending on your setup, this may or may not make sense. <clears throat> but the question is still, like, how do we set everything up, and how do we get, get things up and running? And basically, it's like super simple. All you need to do is you add a file .gitlab .ciaml, um, in the root of your repository, and that's basically it. If you are familiar with Travis, this looks kind of similar, but it's different in detail. But I guess if you can follow along, or if you know the traffic stuff, you can, uh, the, not the traffic, the Travis stuff, um, you can, can follow along easily. So on the first top line, we define the default image that, that we are using, PHP 7.1 CLI. Um, I know this will hurt some of you. Um, unfortunately, Magento isn't able to run with 7.3 right now. And back in the days, this was like, when I compiled the slides last year, this was like the latest version that Magento could support. Um, and then we define a test job. This test job runs in a test stage. We'll see later what that means. It is tagged with a tag docker. We'll see later what that means. And these are the scripts that should be executed. These are the different steps that should be executed when this job is run. The first one is simply like installing a couple of Debian packages that we need to be able to compile a couple of PHP extensions that Magento needs to run. And I think these two lines took me like, like 
almost half a Saturday to figure out and like constantly like redeploying and testing. It was like the most annoying part of this presentation. But anyway, um, we then also need Composer because we want to install um, the Composer dependencies. And these are like the four lines that you would usually copy um, without looking out of the Composer manual. And um, yeah, afterwards you got Composer installed and it's usable. We then need to instruct Composer to use the Magento user and Magento password environment variable, that's the ones we defined before, um, whenever repo magento.com is accessed via HTTP basic authentication. Um, and kind of side note, because this is important, if you like this feature, this is my contribution to Composer. Yeah, awesome, I know. Uh, Jordi completely rewrote my PR and improved it like 10 times, but I can still claim this is like my idea. Um, Right, so we got the configuration right, and um, then we run the Composer install, and hopefully all the packages are installed. So we, we add, commit, and push the file. It ends up in, in GitLab. And you can see there is a blue icon on the very left of the git commit char, and this basically means we have a build job up and running. Cool, so we can click on that icon, can see a list of the pipelines that are configured, um, again, the blue icon, which indicates that there is a job running. You can click on that, and we get an overview of the pipeline. Pretty simple pipeline, I have, I have to say. Um, so we got a test stage. This is test with an uppercase T, um, running a job called test with a lowercase T. Now, again, if you're familiar with Travis and, and similar solutions, uh, just click on the test job, and it will give you like, the output of what's happening during the build. And if you wait a couple of minutes, um, swear to God, in the end it will say, job succeeded. Awesome. Now to be fair, I named this job test, and I'm, I'm really lucky that Sebastian Bergman is not in the audience because he probably will kick my butt naming this thing a test because it doesn't really test stuff, right? Um, we're just installing composer dependencies. So we need something more to be able to run tests of, of any sort. We need um, a database so that we can install Magento and make sure that everything is, is working. Now, um, I could spin up the Docker instances that are in need for this, like a MySQL instance or, or stuff like that, um, in my build script. But then I had to like wait till the, till the, um, till the container is up and running and then continue doing stuff. So that, that also feels like, yeah, that's, that's not really cool. Um, luckily, again, the, the GitLab guys has, has us covered um, with a feature that they call GitLab services. And the idea is that you can define um, uh, multiple images that should be spun up um, before the job that you've defined actually is started. And then you can be relatively sure that the services are, are, are up and running, and you can interact with, with those. Um, and just by a couple of, of lines of configuration. And the pretty cool part is that uh, GitLab has a bunch of logic implemented to check which ports are exposed by these containers that, that you want to, to run. Um, so the default ones that are exposed by, by the image. And um, what GitLab will do is spin up a second container that will just wait until all those services and all those ports just gonna respond. And if that happens, that container will be, will be shut down and your, your container running your job will, will run. Um, Sorry, losing my mic. Got a mic problem. Can you hear me? Okay, cool, sorry. Um, right, so it's, it's, it starts the, your container and you can be like 99.9% .9 sure that, that everything is working out of the box. Um, even though the GitLab guys say, well, you can't really rely on that, that everything is working, but we pretend that we, we were safe. Um, and this is how, how, how you need to do things. Um, again, we first define our image. Um, we can define a couple of variables. Now, these are available to our own jobs, as well as to the other services that, that we include. Like MySQL root password is passed to our jobs, as well as the MySQL container that, that we will spin up. Um, we define our test stage. This is what we've seen before. We um, 
simply add a section called services, and it's going to list all the services that, that we need. And this is all you need to do. You can define services locally within a job, or you could um, define them globally, like for all of your jobs. We do it locally because on staging and production, we already spun up MySQL and some other sort, and we don't want to add another MySQL container just to be there. So that, that doesn't make any sense. Now, if we run the job, GitLab will say, hey, I'm starting the MySQL 5.6 service. I'm pulling the, the Docker image MySQL 5.6. I'm waiting for the services to be up and running. And then I'm pulling the PHP 7.1 CLI image and then just going to execute all the logic so I can see what's, what's happening. And in the end, hopefully, hopefully everything is, is green. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, kind of. OK, I see. Tough audience. I can cope with that. Um, but still, that's not really something that, that you could consider being a build pipeline, right? So we need multiple jobs. They should interact with each other and, and do awesome stuff. And this is exactly what we're doing right now. <clears throat> so again, this is the shared configuration. We have our image defined. We have the variables defined. And next up, we define different stages. We call them test, build, and deploy. Well, that's probably like the, the simple setup these days. Um, you can define a section that is called before script, and these commands would then be executed before each and every job that you have defined. Now, technically, this is bullshit um, because we don't want to install all the, the apt packages for staging and production and stuff. But you could, in this section, do something like the Docker login command, right? Um, so you don't have to retype it every time and making sure that, that it's, uh, it's in sync in, in all places. Um, so that's, that's what you can do in, in, in this place. And then we have our, our test stage. We have seen that before. We do have our build stage. I'll cover that in a second, what it does. And we have our deploy staging um, job which, and this is slightly different to the, other, to the other jobs, has a tag called docker-stage. And the idea is this. You've got multiple runners running in our data center. We got the ones tagged with Docker running over here. They are responsible for building and, and, and testing stuff. We got the ones with the tag docker-stage running over here, and all the staging domains pointing to this part of the data center, right? If I would deploy such the staging um, a staging container over here, um, the domains couldn't reach it, right? Because they are pointing over here. Um, so we can use these tags to steer a bit like where is stuff deployed in, in our infrastructure. Um, for staging deployments, we say we do not want any Git checkout because we already have the container built. So there is no need for, for checking out the whole Git repository. We do define an environment that we call staging and say, OK, this is the URL to our staging environment. And that's also pretty cool because like, you don't need a list in the wiki or, or anywhere else saying, OK, these are URLs for staging. These are URLs production. Um, make sure you use the right credentials and stuff. Um, GitLab will render a couple of buttons in its GUI. And you just click on them, and it will bring you automatically to this URL. So you got it versioned um, and stored in like one central location. And then we say, um, run those builds only for changes that occur on the master branch. <clears throat> Again, we commit the file. The job is running. The pipeline is looking a bit more complex now. So we got the test, build, and deploy stages, and the test, build, and deploy staging jobs. So test is running, all green. Build is running. And now this is what we are doing. Um, imagine up to this point, we have installed all the, all the, comp all the dependencies that, that are needed. Um, we tar that stuff. We move that tarred file back in the project directory. And then we use the, the feature that's called the build arguments of Docker to pass this tarred file um, to the, the Docker build command. This helps you a bit in not needing to maintain multiple Docker files, like one for production, one for development, where you like once add those files and one once do, do not add those files. Um, so you can play around with that a bit. And not really like this kind of approach, but this is like the best thing I could come up right now without the need of having like to maintain multiple files. Great. So it's built. Uh, we tag it. And then we push this image to, to, our, to our registry. That's, that's all we need. 
and this is then basically how it looks. Um, it just appears as a master version within our, our registry. Now, <clears throat> so build is also green, awesome. We can uh, start deploying this on staging. And this is what happens. First, we pull the latest version of this image. Now you can see there is a variable used, CI commit ref slug, and I also used it back in the build stage. Um, throughout this whole build pipeline, this variable holds the exact same value. So I'm always referring to the exact same image, um, which is important if you want to deploy a certain version on, 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 your, on your machines. Um, so we pull the image first. We stop the existing MySQL and the application containers. We remove those images. Then we start MySQL again, and we start the application and then link the application to the MySQL one and pass a couple of traffic labels so that traffic then later knows, like stage myapp.log, just going to point to this exact Docker container. And then we wait like a minute or so and open the URL, and finally we got it deployed. Awesome. OK, tough audience. No worries. So this is staging. Um, for production, it looks pretty similar. So we have a job, deploy underscore prod. Um, again, using a, a different tag, docker dash prod, so we know where the stuff is deployed. You know the story. Um, we don't need a git checkout, because we already have built the Docker container. We name the environment production, because it makes sense, point it to the right domain. Um, say, hey, this should only run for master, uh, for commits on, on master. Now, if we would use this configuration, what would happen um, whenever we make a change on master branch? So um, the test job would run, the build job would run, and then it would synchronously push or, or uh, run this, this, this commands on staging and on production. This is not what we, know, what we want, right? So we want to test it first on staging and then uh, roll it out to production later. And that's what we do with the when manual trigger which basically means that this job is triggered manually through the GitLab UI. This is how it looks. So test is running, all green. Build is running, all green. Deploy staging is running, all green. And then the build pipeline stops. Now, those of you in the first, first row can see there is a play button next to the deploy prod um, job. Well, if it looks like a play button, it pretty much is a play button, which means you can press it. And this is exactly what, what you need to do. So someone in your, in your company needs to press that button, and this will then kick off the, uh, the build or, or the deployment to production. So um, your project manager or your customer can, can approve the stages, uh, the changes on staging, and then someone just, just presses that button and then kicks off that build that will run on production. And the pretty cool thing within GitLab is, is this. So you see, if you, if you check the logs, you can see all the output. And GitLab also warns you, hey, watch out. This is the job created a deployment to production. So this is like the right moment where you can press cancel if you figure out you pressed like the wrong button, um, which rarely happens, I know. <clears throat> so this is, yeah, gives you just another warning sign. Right, and then we just wait again, like a minute or two, hopefully, and this thing is up and running in production. And that is basically it. How awesome is that? Our, thank you. Thank you. Finally, finally. Um, but I see we got some time left. So I got some special for you. <laughs> because we have a problem with this setup. Um, let's take the staging build, for example. Um, if you have one developer, you probably know which state staging is in. If you've got multiple developers that keep committing and, and pushing code, it's pretty hard to, to say or to tell like, which version is actually running on staging, right? So your project manager probably goes crazy figuring out like changes work, not work, changes work, not work. Like all the containers are spun up over and over again. Um, so I guess it would be really cool to have, have such an environment per developer, right? That would be cool? Yeah, that would be cool. But why not go a step further and say, we want such an environment per feature branch? <laughs> My blow. And this is what GitLab calls a review app. Now, to be fair, the documentation of the review app is a bit 
weird, and I have to, have to read it like a couple of times to really figure out <laughs> what it is and how it's, it's doing. So I'll guide you through the process, and, and you'll figure that out way quicker than I did. The idea behind such a review app is basically that those environments that we just created statically, naming it staging and production, can be created dynamically with a dynamic name and a dynamic URL. And this is what, what we take advantage of. So again, we create a deploy underscore review job. Again, it has a custom tag called docker-review so that we know where the stuff is, is deployed. You know the story. Um, we don't do a git checkout, similar to staging a production. And then in the environment section, we say, hey, name this environment review, dash, uh, review slash CI commit ref name. And this is kind of like the branch name you're working on. And this is the URL for this environment. It's called CI environment slug stage my app .log. Now CI environment slug is also like the branch name, but encoded in a, in a URL friendly fashion and then a bit obfuscated. So I have a custom domain for this. All your, all your Swiss admin needs to do is to expose like all the subdomains of stage my app .log and put it on, on, on this network where, where all your review apps are running. And then we also say, whenever this environment should be stopped, call the stop review job. If you don't do that, like all the Docker instances will pile up on the server and somehow, somehow it, will, it will crash or your, your Amazon bill would get like really expensive. So we don't, don't want to do that. Um, and then we say, run this, run this job only if a merge request is open. Now, this is a relatively new feature. Back in the days, you would need to say, OK, run this for all the branches, but not master, which um, isn't kind the same. It's a bit different. But since like I don't know, two or three releases back, they added this feature. So this will only run when you open a merge request, which you should do. And then we define our stop review job, which is called when the environment is stopped, and we would just then kill the containers as, as we don't need them anymore. Um, again, git strategy is set to none because we don't need it. And we add a when manual trigger, which is kind of weird because you never execute this manually. But it's, called, it's triggered by a different job, so you need to set this. <clears throat> and then we use the same environment name so that GitLab can figure out like what environment to stop and set the action to stop. So this then causes GitLab to kill this environment in its own database. So let's test it. Well, let's assume the customer wants us to build a feature to um, yeah, protect your website so no one would ever see like pricing and, and the catalog and stuff without being logged in. Uh, luckily, we've built such a Magento module ourselves. So we just create a feature uh, branch, add the module that, that we need, um, add it, commit it, push it. And when you now open GitLab, GitLab will scream to you, Merge request, merge request, well, showing you all it all over the places. So you just need to press that button. And um, this will lead to a, to a view that looks like this. So you need to define a good, good title. You need to define a good description. Like, not, no, just don't, don't do that. Just provide a proper description if, if you open a merge request. Um, and now what you see is that it automatically started a new build pipeline for this commit. Um, shows you the three dots, the, the three stages going through each, and hopefully and finally deployed on, on staging. Now the question is like, where is this stuff deployed, right? I don't know it. Well, GitLab will tell you. It says, hey, I deployed this branch on this URL. So all I need to do is click this link, we'll open a new browser page, and I can test everything in isolation. And this is then, then basically how it looks. Like awesome, so it's completely separated from all the other inst instances. Um, completely custom, I can completely test it on our own, and, and you're good to go. Now what do we do with that? Like, of course, somehow we need to put it on staging and then put it on productions. How, we, how do we do that? Does any of you have an idea? Well, it's super easy. Just press the merge button. Um, that creates a merge commit in master, which will then kick off the build pipeline again. So we do that. Um, so test runs build runs, deploy staging runs, you manually click the deploy to production button, and boom, we are, we are live. That is pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was waiting for this reaction <laughs> for like the last 50 minutes. 
But I got one more. <laughs> I'm like the Steve Jobs of GitLab, um, but I'm not affiliated with GitLab <laughs> in any way. Um, the pretty cool thing about, about GitLab is it keeps track of like all the environments that, that are currently running. Um, giving you an overview like this, saying, okay, we got the production environment and the staging environment up and running. Um, there's deployment three and two, the job, the last commit, and when the last update happened. So we get really good overview of what happened when. You could also dive in such an environment and then see like which commits made it to, to that specific environment, seeing exactly what was going on. And I could also just do a rollback. So if I figure out like, hey, there's something wrong, I just click the rollback button and the old state is, 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 um, is deployed again. Now, to be fair, your application does need support rollbacks, right? Um, especially uh, regarding database and stuff, so you need to handle that, that on your own. Um, this is not something that, that GitLab can do for you, so you need to do that yourself when the container is, is launched. Um, for some applications like Magento, it's not that easy. Um, but yeah, you need to figure out then ways of, of doing that. Um, and that's actually it. So, so we are, finally we are done with this, <laughs> with this presentation. Um, as you've heard throughout the day and probably yesterday as well, please do rate this talk. I've done it a couple of times, but I want to improve it. Um, if you're interested in new features that, that might be missing, just, just let me know. And that's basically it for me. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Hi. Hi. On that first image uh, you had on container, um, and then you went on to run the uh, composer commands, or right. setting up composer, right. uh, would, wouldn't it be easier to just have Docker in the image? Sorry, uh, composer in the Docker image? You mean like not running the, the composer um, in the container, but like before when you build it. Yeah. Yeah, that might be easier. Yes, yes. So this okay. is just demonstration purposes. All right. I was yeah, just wondering yeah. about best practice, actually. Is, right, would, that, right. would you recommend to have it in the image or run it as part of the build? Um, I would rather run it as, as part of the build. Um, as well, when I, when I showed in the beginning how the container is built, um, we installed these libraries and, and recompiled the PHP um, extensions over and over again. I wouldn't do that either. This is just like for you to take something and just, just play around with it. I just would create a, a, a default build for the application and always use that. Uh, hi, Derek, uh, you have a question. Yes, yes. in one of your <laughs> first slides you showed creating a project. Yeah. There was a third tab, which is import from an existing project. Yep. Does that mean that it would re-import the whole Git repository, repository into GitLab? Or would you be able to run it on something that you already have locally in a Git repository? You can run it against a custom Git repository that is run anywhere. You could import it from GitLab. You could import it from GitHub. Maybe also Bitbucket. And in those cases, I think it would also import like open issues and all that stuff. Um, so it really grabs the whole thing and, and, and gets you in there. Hi. Uh, regarding the credential, like you store it on the pr uh, plain oh, yeah. text, right? <laughs> uh, sorry, I just <laughs> couldn't follow uh, you. Re regarding the credential you store on the plain text, is there any way where we can like encrypt and decrypt the things so that we can store our things on the Git or anything? I don't think so. At least I'm not aware. Um, I think you need to provide them, them as is in, in plain text. Um, right. Sorry. <laughs> Open a feature request. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, oh, God, my voice is deeper than I thought. Um, no problem. Have you, have you got any, uh, have you got any um, thoughts on, um, so what you've been doing is setting up these custom custom pipelines, but uh, one of the things I'm finding quite confusing in GitLab Cloud at the moment is they're, um, they've just started releasing their automated CI build pipelines, which is turned, o turned on by default now when you, when you create a new project in the cloud. You mean this auto DevOps feature? Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't tried it yet. I don't know how good or, or, or how bad it is. Um, um, yeah, since we run all that stuff locally and, and um, um, 
out of the box using our, our GitLab CI YAML files. This, this just works for me, but I don't know how, how good or bad this, this auto DevOps thing, thing works. Cool. Hello? Yeah. Uh, the, the script, as it were, that you actually deploy uh, is in the gitlab.cr.yaml in the repo. Is there any way of locking that down so that only your DevOps people can uh, change the, the way the thing gets deployed? I don't think so. So this is really one of the downsides of, of GitLab. Their, their um, role-based authentication mechanism is, is really bad. So they've got like four or five roles and it's like this is it. So, and all the cool stuff can be just done by like the master role or I think it's, it's maintainer role these days. Um, so most of your team needs to have the maintainer role <laughs> and that just makes things even worse. But that's a different story. Um, no, sorry. 